Within the boundaries of human existence, and as far back as the memories of the most ancient Earthlings will stretch, catastrophic space phenomena in the form of plasmic energy discharges occurring in the skies of our planet were documented by the inhabitants of the Earth taking shelter from the phenomena in the most remote locations imaginable. Sometimes these plasmic events were a thing of beauty, as David Talbot of the Thunderbolts Project points out, and sometimes they cause scenes of unimaginable terror. In the form of petroglyphs, the prehistoric inhabitants of this planet carved their documentation of the plasma events which is now being deciphered, and it shows undoubtedly that the ancient civilization witnessed something that was so outrageous that they sought to document it for all time. Their message has reached us through the ages, and thanks to years of painstaking research by Anthony Peratt, it now appears to overwhelmingly show a worldwide documentation of petroglyph patterns that were actually happening in space and visible here on Earth. Not only that, it also rained down onto our planet, affecting life drastically, forcing people to take shelter in caves, the only natural shelter capable of withstanding the onslaught happening outside. Now, what if we were to tell you that the petroglyphs and documentation seen around the world of the so-called squatter man has been recreated in laboratory conditions? What if we were to tell you that these ancient petroglyphs match up to plasma discharges recreated in a lab with astounding accuracy? Known in the lab as Zenith Pinch, Z Pinch, and this was also seen in deep prehistory in the sky of our planet for around a thousand years. An intense inflow of plasma creating an immense aurora that was then shaped by its own magnetic field, a Z Pinch. And these petroglyphs are showing exactly what was happening. Petroglyphs have mystified the most curious of our kind for millennia. Found on every continent with striking similarities and widely regarded as the oldest surviving markings on this planet. They could be thousands or even millions of years old, but definitely dating to prehistory. That is, upward of 7,000 years ago in a very reserved scale of the sense of time with Campfire remnants found close to petroglyphs in Santa Fe dating to 4,000 years before Christ after carbon-14 dating. Thousands and perhaps tens of thousands of years ago, there was electrical activity in the sky as plasma discharge sequences moved through discrete phases. The explosion of culture documentation seems to have roots directly relating to this and the misinterpretation of these cultural roots all over the world can now be corrected. They were documenting what they were seeing in the sky. Together with the YouTube channel Kronos, we intend to help you understand a past that they would rather you wouldn't believe to be real. In this type of plasma discharge occurring in space and as visible from the viewpoint of the observer here on Earth thousands of years ago, and also recreating in laboratory conditions by the legendary physicist Anthony Peratt, this shows the edges of the upper disc may appear to point forming arms and those of the lower torso of the apparent humanoid known as a torus may appear to point down forming legs. The underlying hourglass style pattern with many subtle variations not only occurs around the world, it is among the most fundamental forms appearing in highest energy electric discharge in the laboratory. Recorded by ancient man, this representation of the prehistoric petroglyphs found all over the world in countries including Italy in a region known as Volca Monica, one of the largest valleys in eastern Italy. We are again confronted with the squatter man type design, which is also seen 3,600 miles away in the United Arab Emirates. And this is repeated on Hawaii, 8,800 miles away from the UAE, and also appears to be immortalized in the undeciphered Rongo Rongo inscriptions of Easter Island, the most remote location on the planet. And this is continually repeated in Venezuela, Spain, New Mexico, Armenia, Arizona, and even in Ghana, but to name just a few other locations. 
that appears to show a worldwide phenomenon taking place in the sky and which appears to have an intense inflow of plasma creating this immense aurora system pinched by its own magnetic field and recorded by the ancients of prehistory as a humanoid figure in the squatting position with arms directed upward. Take for example the Arizona petroglyphs, abstract designs to the would-be observer, but according to Anthony Peratt, these are in fact very accurate representations of what was seen in the ancient sky in prehistory as he has shown by comparing radiograph imagery to squatter man images repeated across the world by the million count and upward and always located in mountain regions where these ancient earthlings must have sought shelter in the view of the unstable plasmic aurora. The conception from Anthony's radiograph matches with shocking accuracy to these worldwide petroglyphic phenomena all recorded the same way and sometimes with the two dots at either side representing the Z pinch gravitational influence of the sequence as recorded in the lab. The effects of which are possibly being generated by solar system planets soon to be discussed in this series by the Lost History Channel. Now what if we were to tell you that all these petroglyphs around the world are oriented in the direction of magnetic south? All of them as shown at the Arizona site and now realized at all other worldwide locations the artist of all the petroglyphs are in a vantage viewpoint of the magnetic south pole from these locations all across the entire planet what was happening was the center of the plasma column in space was coming in right at the south magnetic pole generating synchrotron radiation which was extraordinarily bright and all the petroglyphs around the world seemed to have a blinder of some sort that was shielding the observer from the center of the bright radiation and this allowed the documentation in rock art of these instabilities. It seems these people emerged from the caves they were sheltering in during quiet periods to etch this documentation. It's all oriented magnetic south and this is vital for understanding the direction the aura was coming from and what may have been causing the intense phenomena. The stunning fact is that these artistic designs are only found at locations where the observer can have a clear view of the magnetic south direction but with some kind of blinder protecting the observer from the exposure. Interestingly they are not found in areas where the south pole is obscured by mountains. They just don't exist unless this vantage is clear and this is a stunning and compelling clue that almost overwhelmingly spells out what was happening. The largest petroglyph site in Europe at Italy's Valca Monica site in the Alpine region also shows that there are in the direction orientation of the magnetic south and they too are putting their rock art in locations that seem to have a limited exposure to the extreme aurora event. The intense synchrotron radiation light if exposed to it which would have disastrous effects if exposed for any length of time and this is again repeated as far away as Australia at the site at Akaru Rock Art Cave depictions. Again orientated to the South Pole with limited exposure in the protection of the mountains but with a clear sight view of the sky. The Babylonians were apparently the first to develop systematic observation of the planets and they recorded the celestial motions with considerable skill but in the laying of the foundation of later astronomy they also preserved a critical link with the past. Again and again they asserted a claim that could only appear preposterous to the modern translator they declared that the distant planets were the gods of former times. What exactly does it mean the gods of former times? Is it a literal term for these plasmatic aurora events from which the Sumerian and all other civilizations emerged? We are again confronted by the squatter man figure, a literal depiction of events in the heavens in the form of plasmatic aurora and what would later be referred to as the gods of former times by the ancient Sumerians. Sumerian myths say that the rites and standards of kingship descended from the central luminary An, 
founder of the Golden Age. And in Babylonian myth, the Sumerian An appears as Anu, first in the line of gods and kings, and according to the best authorities on Babylonian astronomy. The god Anu was mysteriously linked to the planet Saturn. The gods of Egypt, messengers through time, dominates of a past culture who sought to express their representations in a meaningful way. But could some of these ancient gods be manifestations of ancient electrical activity in the sky? The snake god Nehepkau, for example, could be a literal representation of the immense plasmatic aurora event in prehistory. Could ancient Earth inhabitants be using the snake to represent the unbelievable event? And why wouldn't they link a snake aurora wavering in the sky to the closest lightness available for them to describe here on Earth? Such a dramatic event in the sky would obviously inspire the ancient beings of the Earth to depict such an event, and that is exactly what they have done with the petroglyphs of the Squatter Man linked all over the world, and may even be inspiring the depictions of a god in this manner and Throughout the ages, a religion absolves around the creation of a deity that was perhaps the representation of the greatest sky event within the past million years or so as witnessed all across the world. The motivation behind the depiction of snakes in ancient Egypt is unclear. And this leads us into mythology, where it is stated from the earliest records of civilization in Egypt that it is clear that the snake played a significant cultural role as enigmatic creator with supernatural powers. Alternatively seen as benevolent creator and protector of wisdom and eternal life, or perpetrator of evil and agent of death. Serpents are associated with the origin of the world and creation with veneration of ancestors, bestowal of wisdom and power, and symbol of Mother Earth and eternity. In ancient Egypt, the serpent was believed to be the first offspring of primeval Earth, identified with the gods Seth and Apophis, and in constant warfare against the sun god Ra. What if these representations are exact details of sky events in deep prehistory? Nehepkau is the primordial netter who is present at both the birth and death of our perception of a physical reality. In this position, he clearly represents the supposed 13th constellation in the zodiac. Ophiuchus, as shown with two snakes' heads and holding two snakes in either hand with eerie echoes of the Squatterman phenomena, the Egyptians believed this god was one of the original gods from the beginning of time. Swimming around in the primordial waters before creation, the Aurora, then bound to the sun god Ra when time began. He was a god of protection who protected the pharaoh and all Egyptians, both in life and in the afterlife. And his name means that he is the one that brings together the ka, the double of a person, an animal, a plant, a body of water, or even a stone, and unites the double with the physical body that the ka would reside in. Be it an animate or inanimate object, such as depicting an immense aurora event on a rock, for example, and this perhaps relates to these events as spiritual because of the explosion of earth activity that would then follow before remembering the event as a deity in this manner. If the snake deity is in battle with the sun god Ra, it would then stand to reason that during the day and throughout the night before the sun arose again and also visible in daylight, that the deity Nehepkau is a representation of the aurora event transformed through the ages into the character of the snake and still in remembrance in oral storytelling as the understanding of the prehistoric event molded into cultural and religious beliefs of godlike events. In the sky. The Egyptians believed that he swallowed seven, a magical number, cobras, using them for his magical power. It was thought that he was one of the gods who announced the new pharaoh to the gods at the beginning of his rule. He was at one point a rather fierce and aggressive deity, and the god Atim had to press his nail into Nehepkau's spine so he could control the snake god and perhaps 
This describes the fear felt at the beginning of such an intense sky event that lasted ages before the apparent God intervened and calmed the event down to the eye of the beholder. Remember, sometimes the aurora inspired fear and terror, and sometimes it was a thing of beauty, as the Thunderbolts project points out. Nehepkau was the snake god of protection, who was called on when the people needed him. One of the original gods of Egypt, only turned from chaos by the sun god. He was a benevolent god, a god of magic, who bound the Ka with the physical form, and who judged them in the afterlife. Although he did not have a cult following of his own, he was a god who they invoked in magical spells. The Book of the Dead mentions Nehepkau as present in the Daybark with Ra, thus leading his powers to the maintenance of cosmic order, and is also among the deities cited in the so-called Negative Confession of the Book of the Dead Spell 125, translated as the denial delivered to him as O Uniter of Attributes, who came forth from the city. I have not made distinctions of others from myself. Perhaps with a decree of speculative excess in the Book of the Dead, Spell 17, the deceased says, I fly as a hawk, I have cackled as a goose, I destroy eternity like Nehepkau. The first part of the formula involving the hawk and the goose is familiar from a variety of contexts, perhaps relating to the extreme sky events, while the reference to destroying eternity perhaps means that identifying with Nehepkau grants the deceased a power of persistence and renewal more durable than eternity itself, or perhaps that the great aurora event in prehistory last a very long time, which destroyed the previous wave of existence before the re-emergence. Nehepkau's occurrence in amulets and magical spells indicates that he was assumed to exercise a protective function for the living. The effects of the prehistoric aurora event in the minds of the earthlings who witnessed it led to a symbolic cultural uprising from which the original meanings became forgotten in our time. What if the plasmatic event in prehistory can be linked from everything from the scarab symbol in Egypt to the Stonehenge monument in Britain, and even down to the headdress of the Native American population? The Native American headdress is just another representation of the immense charged particles of prehistory interacting with our planet's magnetic field. Of course, these particles in the Aurora Borealis are incredibly tame compared to what happened in the past. As the Birkeland Curtain develops into a spiral, much like water going down the drain, it begins to pinch off as the gravitational influence takes hold, and this creates a series of very bright plasmatic spheroids, generating lightning the entire length of the structure, developing further into a donut-shaped column through hundreds of years of generating visible and intense ultraviolet light and x-rays and other electromagnetic radiation that would have devastated any established society at the time as the structure violently merges and it becomes over energized eventually it will release a violent shockwave of catastrophic proportions as this interacts with earth's atmosphere it generates visions to the earthlings of seemingly dancing squatter men people and the appearance of goat horns as the shadow wave display become evident to the observer. From lab research and studying the evidence left by ancient observers, it appears that as the energy increases, the high energy plasma column in the polar cusp passes through various consistent phases. Since electric currents are prone to pulsing, the appearance of the display would therefore fluctuate back and forth from one energy phase to another. The upper terminus or outer rim of the aurora's column is usually represented in rock art as a very large, round, bright disk. Plasma is mainly concentrated in the outer surface of the funnel with a central, often red-colored axis. Sometimes it is drawn with the aurora's column below it and depicted as a series of concentric rings 
oscillating with spikes emanating outward from the outer circle. This is often misidentified as an image of the sun, which is actually never seen as anything other than a usually yellow disk except rarely during a solar eclipse. Surrounding the funnel are plasma bundles or rays. Starting from 56, they reduce in number to 4 as the energy increase through time. There are represented in the petroglyph rock art record as pinwheels, sailing ships, spiky disc, bullhorns, or what even resembles a fancy crown or full-fledged Native American headdress. Bill Petrie writes that when water goes down the drain, you notice that the flow is funnel-shaped and hollow at the top, and that as the funnel develops, the flow slows down as well. This is kind of like what happens as the outer rim of the polar cusp. Here, the plasma flows around the axis, leaving a low-pressure pool in the top valley of the polar cusp. When plasma gets trapped here, it gives rise to what is called the aurora, beginning its life as a wisp and often quite prominent in many petroglyphs. The feature is often pictured bird-like and so could be seen as the proverbial phoenix rising from the fire. They are portrayed at all stages of the high-energy aurora, with many different forms having been recorded in ancient rock art. Several distinct forms would be noticeable. For example, eye and nose mask are the result of small side eye circles above an oval-shaped nose. In the area where the eyes would be between the spherical isophytes, a distinct X pattern would often develop, as well as more complex hourglass patterns. The final stage of the silky column would be when the developing tauros inside shine through, giving rise to what appear to be faces with goggles or large eyes. They are known as face masks. With increasing energy input, the celerity spheroids begin to flatten under the pressure of the inflowing plasma, with the shimmering bright white outer envelope has mostly dissipated, leaving a stack of distinctly donut-shaped toroids. The speeding electrons, now flowing in circular paths around the axis, generate synchrotron radiation, giving the stack a brilliant bright white appearance. And even at this stage, you would readily notice the perspective changes from an on edge at the bottom to oblique at the top of the stack. In an actual column, the central axis would most likely be red in color. You would be able to see through the forming toroids and they would appear as two bright circles side by side, just like when you cut a donut in half. As the flow of the electric current increases, the toroids flatten and begin to warp and fold at the top and bottom. The top toroid will deform and cup upward. A feature or head has also developed inside the rim at the outer end of the axis, which may be entered or to one side. The bottom toroid will also warp and the base appears to look like a bell or Christmas tree stand. Depending on the perspective of the viewer, the column of toruses can take on a branched configuration resembling segmented animals or even plants. Images depicting this stage are often referred to as ladders or caterpillars. The incoming plasma has two components, energy intensity and flow. Increasing the flow of the incoming plasma puts enormous pressure on the toroids causing them to take on a decidedly melting appearance. The stack would be relatively stable in number, but the shape is in flux. As the intensity of the current continues to rise, the column is further deformed, losing the base and most of the flattened toroidal shapes. The intense pressure forces the remaining toroids to merge and give rise to a wide range of box-like geometric shapes known as pipettes. A pipette is a long, hollow glass tube, which is used as a graduated dropper for liquids. These forms are generated by fluctuating forces acting on the decreasing number of toruses. The experience of witnessing such an event must have been quite moving, as the toruses would flip back and forth violently from one shape to another. We are now approaching the greater energy levels observed for the high-energy aurora. 
The remaining toroids have wrapped and produced well-defined vortex curls at their edges. What's left is a solitary tauros and the remnants of two others giving a bowl shape at the top and a bell-shaped below. The remaining central toroid is often depicted as tubular, flat, or spherical dial in shape, and sometimes the drawings resemble folded petals or mushrooms. Occasionally, the ends of the warped toroids branch and resemble fingers, toes, or lightning. This gives the zoomorphic frog and lizard, or the anthropomorphic squatter man, or interpretations for the figures. Remember, the auroral column is a three-dimensional, radically symmetrical structure. Looking up into the column from here on Earth, the shape will resemble less the squatter man and more like two bells stuck end to end with a donut between them. And that's because you are looking through more column material. There is a wide range of representations and hence interpretations of the highest energy phases of the diminishing number of toruses in the stacks. The remains of the top and bottom toruses forms what appear to be arms and legs, which can be pointed either up or down. The head of the figure may be absent. When it is present, it occasionally resembles a bird or other animal. Sometimes the bottom of the figures is split into three parts and the remnant of the original central axis extending below the legs has often been identified as a tail, which has been taken to indicate a male spirit. However, if the axis end is larger and oval in shape, it has been interpreted as a vulva or even the image of childbirth. We often see faces in leaves on a tree or in other features in everyday life, but there's nobody there. It seems that we see what we want to see and what follows are groups of similar images of the squatter man phases from the multiple toruses to the single toros form. Since the electric current flow isn't constant, there will be fluctuations in both the number of toruses that can be seen at any given time or their prominence as well. The Earth's magnetic pole doesn't stay put. It has a habit of wandering around. An oblique view would occur when the magnetic pole was on the opposite side of the Earth and you look up into the column and view the image at an angle from below. An oblique view of the column at this stage depicting a prominent single toros would be reminiscent of someone playing with a hula hoop. Currently, the magnetic axis is on our side of the pole, so should it recur in the near future, you would be looking up into the column. As the energy intensifies, the plasma image brightens appreciatively. The stick men then become a squatting figure with what appears to be a face with two eyes. The bright stack looks overexposed and the eyes prominent and ghostly. The accompanying figures show the single toros, central axis, and bell-shaped top and bottom. Two eyes are visible in the shape between the toros and the axis. As the intensity of the event reaches maximum, the eyes are just about the only feature discernible, but many more traits of the prehistoric aurora event have been assimilated into the modern times without the original meaning. No matter where you look in the world for petroglyphs, we are always confronted with the humanoid figure with raised arms and in the squatting position as ancient earthlings tried so hard to reach through the ages to deliver a message of a worldwide event in the sky and in the form of the squatter man. This is the representation of the greatest energy levels observed for the high energy aurora event in prehistory. In Norway, we are confronted by this again at a petroglyph site known as the Bigby Man. We see this aurora phenomenon in the apparent humanoid form because, of course, our brain is telling us that this is nothing but an abstract etching of an ancient earthling doing the hula hoop. This is until we link an ancient catastrophe like an immense plasmatic aurora event with laboratory evidence that overwhelmingly shows us that this is in fact the representation 
of an event in the sky and one in which ancient earthlings all across the world went to great lengths to document. They left this message for us to find in a language that would be realized and of course only now are we making the connection from the abstract to the reality. Viewed in cross section, the so-called Bigby Man is now visible to the observer as two dots or circles and literally looks like a person hula hooping with the bottom squatter man showing the apparent hula hoop now as two dots in a different stage of development. To the observer, the bright plasma column, the amount of plasma viewed in an edge on view will be the brightest portion and will appear to be emanating from two circles. When the squatter man arms in the upward position prominent and takes on the appearance of rings or horns, this upper circular structure could be the result of a prominent outer rim of the polar cusp. The Norway Tourism Board suggests these petroglyphs were created just after the last ice age, around 12,000 years ago, but the current knowledge of such estimates does in fact need serious reconsideration as our timeline of past events is all over the place. Norway is not in any way as aware of its prehistoric monuments, stone circles, and other ancient sites. For example, in the UK, there is great interest for sites such as Stonehenge and the Standing Stones of Stennis in Scotland. Both locally and internationally, with thousands of tourists visiting every year, not even realizing what they are looking at, but being drawn there anyway, but very few travel to explore the Hunfelt or Bigbyfelt and similar sites in Norway. Even parts of the local population remain in the dark about their region's hidden treasures. And of course, the world is in the dark about what these are really representing. Time to light that up and the truth of what they are being more spectacular than any stick figure abstract explanation anyway. And this has been constantly regurgitated for ages. Officially described as ships, sunwheels, and animals, as well as cupular descriptions carved into the rock, these are a great representation of a sky event as witnessed by the observers directly and then carved onto the rock with the observer again having a clear view of the magnetic south pole where the event was emanating sequotron radiation and x-rays in a thunderous column of plasmatic aurora that would have been clearly visible for millennia and responsible for these efforts all across the world to document what was happening. The knowledge was lost, but thanks to research of Anthony Peratt, we are starting to reawaken to what we once knew to be true. In Norway, rock art has been found at more than 1,100 sites with many motifs occur regularly across the region and the design and composition of even the most common motifs vary hugely in different parts of the country according to both the era and function of the particular site. Their view of the sky and the exact time in history the etchings were carved, if we can track down what caused the event, then perhaps we can trace this all the way back to the date when these petroglyphs may have been made. What is millions of years ago or right around the last ice age as the Norwegian Tourist Board suggests? The Bigby petroglyphs were painted red so that the modern visitors are able to see and enjoy them. The paint only highlights them. However, even though the stone carvings are visible, it does not mean their meanings and symbolic value is equally clear and the local tour guides will tell you as much. Rather than trying to set about with a glorious narrative, they simply say that the carvings depict different variations of ships, human squatter men, wagons, and symbols. Although some of the carvings are easier to make out, for example, the ships, it is not clear what stories they try to tell and the many symbols of different character or even more mysterious as their meaning is still unknown, though some believe them to be linked to the sun and fertility worship. Because of this, the petroglyphs have been important in trying to figure out the myths and ceremonies connected to agriculture, harvesting, and fertility in ancient Norway, and the original meaning that seems lost to history. 
Another mystery surrounding the carvings is how they were made. Archaeologists have not yet been able to discover what types of tools were used by the ancient inhabitants of Ostfold to create this magnificent stone art in Norway. What the tourism board describes as ships with people on board are actually pretty common in the petroglyph record. And of course, we refer to Norway as home of the Vikings, and the pattern of the ship carved into the rock art becomes apparent. But in the petroglyph record, they are actually known as rakes. Rakes are the series of vertical lines, either straight or wavy, and they are usually interpreted as rain. However, what they probably represent is what we normally see as Birkeland curtains of aurora in the ancient prehistoric skies of our planet, and occasionally they are attached to other features, which give valuable clues to their valuable meaning, which evolved into the modern times, keeping an attachment to the ancient meaning with the lost references to the actual event. The images are often combined to form scenes and expressive compositions of the ancient aurora event of prehistory. These rock carvings are an art treasure and an invaluable part of Europe's prehistorical cultural heritage. The squatter man phenomena around the world must be the representation of an immense aurora discharge phenomena. Influenced by its own magnetic field, as shown in the petroglyphs throughout the world. When an intense coronal mass ejection occurs, for example, near the center of the solar disk and its magnetic field is strong and oriented southward, the power of the solar wind magnetosphere generator may exceed known expectations for observable patterns. Simultaneously, the magnetic field produced by the aurora discharge current produces an intense geomagnetic storm ultimately heating Earth's upper atmosphere and when oxygen atoms collide with heated atoms, the atoms emit a dark red light seen high in the aurora curtain. The aurora curtain is greenish white in color and emitted from atomic oxygen subjected to electrons. One of the basic forms of the aurora is a curtain-like structure that is generally referred to as an aurora arc. When they appear in multiples, each arc consists of several arc elements, which have curtain-like structure. This curtain-like form of the aurora exhibits deformations known as curls, folds, and spirals. Spirals that occur when the Birkeland current peaks are 31 miles in size, have a lifetime of around 10 minutes, and have a clockwise rotational sense. This immense aurora morphologies are a consequence of this instability. The appearance of the aurora borealis and australis are obviously mirrored from the same solar events, but the electrodynamic of the Earth's magnetic sphere, ionosphere, thermosphere system, and the relationship between this phenomenon and the reaction taking place are simply not that well understood at all. So, the meteorological science of the upper atmosphere over the Arctic and Antarctic is a topic of ongoing study. When wind blows over water here on the Earth, we see the phenomenon known as the Kelvin-Helmholtz instability. This instability is not only restricted to a water surface as clouds, but is evident through other natural phenomena as the ocean, Saturn's bands, Jupiter's red spot, and the sun's corona, and also in this immense aurora events in space and in Earth's upper atmosphere, in which vortices develop through a fluid when a critical velocity in the flow is exceeded with a large increase in the resistance to flow. This generates a circular observation as immortalized all around the world by the same observers who documented the zenith pinch squatter man. The circular pattern represents the Birkeland currents, as many as 56 and as little 4, with 4 being the minimum number of Birkeland currents possible after a cycle, and 56 the apparent maximum as observed in modern times. These are electric currents in Earth's ionosphere as recorded in prehistory by ancient Earth inhabitants. Wait till you hear this. The petroglyphs found in abundance at the Columbia River region in North America 
are simply sensational because they appear to show aurora plasma phenomena at this location with a very similar representation found over 5,000 miles away in the form of a vase recovered at Nazca in Peru. Nazca, of course, very famous for the so-called Nazca lines known as geoglyphs, which is an ancient Greek word meaning earth, ground, engraved. Not always literal when considering the effort to cross mountains and other rugged terrains to keep the glyphs straight, especially at Nazca. According to Anthony Peratt, within the region containing the lines, there is a high ground blinder gap with elevations rising to the south and the range defining the gap rises abruptly at the westernmost boundary of the lines, while the easternmost lines end where the planet meet east-west hills and a mountain range to the south. If they were documenting the Aurora event, then they had the same blinders the petroglyph observers had and they were sheltering in this region. The famous landing strips are representations of the current-like Berkline currents as viewed in prehistory. Highly focused sharp edge synchrotron light from the relativistic mega atmosphere electrons would have produced white light images of the filaments on the ground visible even in daylight. Vertical striped petroglyphs or vertical white striped petrographs are found worldwide. For example, white striped petrographs are common to Australia from the Northern Territory to the Flinders Range. One of the better known pictographs occurring often in mythology are the striped lightning brothers, which can be replicated by looking nearly straight into the plasma columns with the Birkeland currents incoming towards Antarctica, making up the torsos of the figures. The dark stripe running vertically in the figures toward the nose is the dense central region of the plasma column. Ancient earthlings in deep prehistory did witness and record the effects and images from an intense solar outburst lasting millennia. And this can be deduced by the records that have endured the ages. For the most part, very little changed, but over the millennia, these representations have completely lost their meaning. However, thanks to lifelong research by the Anthony Peratts of the world, these anomalies are beginning to be corrected and the work will prevail for centuries to come. Explained by Anthony is the fact that when you have a thin plasma column, it filaments into 56 individual columns respectfully, known as the 56 Birkeland currents. Regardless of size and as they develop into vortexes forming a cylinder, they get larger each time with the 56 currents ending up as four at the end of the cycle as proven by supercomputer simulations. 56 at its thinnest at the beginning of the peak of the cycle, 4 at its fattest at the end of the cycle. But why is this important and what does it mean for us? Well, if you look at petroglyphs or geoglyphs around the world for that matter, you come up with astounding results. Formed by ancient earthlings as documented at these locations are the events they witnessed in the sky. Recreated in modern times by supercomputer simulations and now realized to have actually occurred all around the world with a vantage observation of the magnetic south pole are the representations in locations like the Navajo Reservation in Arizona where the seal of the Navajo Nation also confirms the 56 filaments and this is repeated 8,800 miles away from Arizona in Australia at the location of the Wanjina Gorge where we again see no fewer than 56 rays of filaments radiating outward as seen in the ancient electric skies of our planet. The exact precision at these distances cannot be ignored any longer. They match up at opposite ends of our planet and this means they all saw the same thing in the sky. Now, what if we were to tell you the famous four o'clock rapids petroglyph on the Columbia River matches up shocking accuracy to the John Day bar glyphs in Oregon. It matches the Australian glyphs and the Arizona Navajo Nation glyphs match up with the connection of the seemingly random 56 rays radiating. 
the now realized 56 Birkeland filaments, and this is repeatedly matching up all across the world, including in Kazakhstan, where again, the 56 rays are depicted. 56, remember, no fewer, no less. Is that just a coincidence? Because in China, the Axis Mundi also shows 56 rays, and these anomalies are matching up to places like the stunning Canela Village in Brazil, where they actually built 56 houses at the end of the 56 rays. The strange thing about these significant anomalies and their relationship to the immense plasma event of prehistory is the fact that they were capable of constructing megalithic monuments that represent the 56 filaments in the curtain Birkeland current. And this is now being realized in the most famous monument in the Northern Hemisphere, Stonehenge. Stonehenge was always there. The Celtics tell us that they were there when they arrived, and the modern-day Britons are descended from these people. So when the first people of the modern era arrived on the British Isles, it was already there and in a ruined state. The age of the structure is unknown, but at this location, a connection to Southern and Northern America and also Australia and Middle Eastern countries including Kazakhstan, can now be realized. Compensating for the reconstruction of Stonehenge and the moving of the ancient placements to modern positions, but with an open mind regarding these connections across the planet, if you take the pattern of the Navajo petroglyph and overlay it at Stonehenge, something very sensational becomes apparent. The matching up of the outer stones of the Stonehenge arrangement all the way to the inner circle is jaw-dropping. Never before has an explanation of what the ancient monument was has it appeared like this. Is Stonehenge in fact another representation on our planet of the dramatic aurora event as witnessed in prehistory? Are the ancient earthlings warning us of the cycle of this event at this location and can we predict when it might happen again with these megalithic wonders matching petroglyphs across the planet? It took 1,000 years for the 56 radiating filaments to reduce to just four. Comparing the four o'clock rapids to Stonehenge shockingly shows the change the filaments began to go through in its life cycle as this began to reduce over the vast period of time as shown by Anthony Peratt in Laboratory Conditions, it's astonishing. What does the creation of humanity represent? That is, what event, if any, did we perceive in a jump-starting of consciousness, imagination, and the process of beginning to understand the bigger picture of existence? Our struggle to understand our existence has awakened our hidden nature of curiosity and enlightenment. And to what effect exactly did the prehistoric aurora event have on our ancestors' ability to conceive our presence here on the Earth? Prehistory is unknown to us because it no longer exists. The remnants of a past that is completely lost to us is only existing in stone and in the form of petroglyphs, geoglyphs, and other strange patterns left down for all time by a past presence of intelligence who documented the events they were actively witnessing in the sky as the etching of stone material took place by beings who were considered primitive. And we only consider this primitive people because of the passage of time and the recycling of their existence. The shocking revelation of petroglyph patterns not being of the abstract mind and in fact being literal representations of intense plasmatic events happening in space and raining down onto our planet through the protective atmospheric bubble could only have been realized now. That is, within the past 100 years, because we could simply not fathom these petroglyphs until we had the technological know-how to experiment in laboratory conditions. Replicating the squatter man as a zenith pinch auroral phenomena and further exploring the different stages of such forces as laid out in no uncertain terms, and the now vital clues of the petroglyph record echoed all across the earth by dozens of separated cultures in a dramatic undertaking of documentation that is now the subject of constant study and understanding not only the past event, 
but also what it might mean for our future existence. The profound events that shaped every culture in the world and their belief systems begins in space. Planet Earth was once a strangely different place to what we recognize today, and the ancient Earthlings have reached across time and space to leave us the clues as to what was going on. Only by understanding these clues can we truly begin to awaken. The birth of civilization happened after these events and catalyzed our understanding of gods and religion, dance and belief. Prayer and communication and these facts are not in dispute. Could the planets have been visible to Earth observers a very long time ago? That is, as visible as the sun or the moon is today. In this sense, we would literally be living in the presence of the gods as David Talbot asserts in his book, The Saturn Myth. Could planetary powers have once ruled the celestial theater in the lost age of the gods? If the planets engaged with each other electrically when the orbits were set off differently than what they are today, then of course this would have inspired dramatic events to take place in the sky. This was documented by Earth observers over a very long time until that is, the planets seemed to go to war with one another, creating shocking and sudden sways in the intense sky events here on the Earth. And this would have detrimented the presence of any civilization forcing survivors to shelter within Earth cave systems as the intensity unfolded. The petroglyphs and geoglyphs that have confounded our understanding are representations of these events, never to be forgotten and documented for all time, much to our discovery in recent times. Described by David Talbot as an event, as the most intense and chaotic time in human history, and the misrepresentation is that these observers somehow were inspired by events that could still occur today. This is the modern phenomena of ignorance, but the stable fact maintains that every single culture on this modern plane of existence are reenacting in their belief one way or another, a critical juncture that is the intense aurora event of prehistory when the planets were the gods. These electrical events have evoked the entire symbolic contents of human existence today, from the serpent to the deluge and the stairway to heaven. The provoking of humanity by the apparent gods of old, the dramatic discharges in the sky being exchanged by the planets. According to a long established school of thought, man's consciousness of a supreme being emerged slowly from a primitive fascination with petty spirits and demons apparently inspired by the need for food and eventually into the global traditions of today. If we were to take this as fact without question, then we would believe that before the Hebrews, Greeks, and Hindus developed their ideas of a supreme god, they must have possessed beliefs and customs similar to those of modern day tribes of Africa, Australia, or Polynesia for that matter. The same processes are considered evident for developed cultures in modern times, simply because it is considered that these tribes are somehow stuck in a staid, primitive state. But what if this was false? Based on these conclusions, and only by slow development could a race rise above the ludicrous magic, totems, and fetishes of the savage brute. But a surprising awakening to this thought occurs when you consider the fact that the advocates of the various evolutionary theories and their fascination with present day primitive culture almost never concerns themselves with the oldest religious texts and symbols which have come down to us from prehistoric practices. The sacred hymns and eulogies of ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia reveal a tradition of a great god reaching back into prehistoric times, a comparison of early and later sources, rather than suggesting a development, actually indicates the disintegration of a once unified idea into magic, astrology, and other elements with which the evolutionists associated the first stages of religion. As attested by the Thunderbolts project, there are grounds for speaking of an archaic monotheism, astral in nature, existing long before the idea of God received its spiritual and philosophical elevation in Hebrews and Greek thought. 
To the ancients themselves, the entire question was simply a matter of concrete history. The present world is a fragmented copy of an earlier age, in which the supreme light god stood alone in a primeval sea, occupying the cosmic center. Ancient Egyptian texts repeatedly invoke a singular figure worshipped as the greatest and highest light of the primeval age. According to the pyramid text, perhaps the world's oldest religious hymns, Atom, a god born in the abyss before the sky existed, before the earth existed. But the texts of all periods look back to the same primordial time when Atom shone forth alone. I came into being of myself in the midst of the primeval waters, states the god in the Book of the Dead. More than once, the coffin texts recall the time when Atom was alone before he had repeated himself. He was alone in the primeval waters, they say. I was the spirit in the primeval waters, he who had no companion when my name came into existence. Each locality in Egypt appears to have possessed its own special representative of the Father God. To some, he was Horos, the God who came first into being when no other God had yet come into existence, when no name of anything had yet been proclaimed. Other traditions knew him as Ra, the God one who came into being in the beginning of time. O thou who didst give thyself birth, O one, mighty one of myriad forms and aspects, king of the world. The followers of Amun proclaimed their god, the Ancient of Heaven, father of the gods. Ptah was the splendid god who existed alone in the beginning. The different local names of the primeval deity, though adding complexity to Egyptian religion as a whole, did not cloud the underlying idea. He is the God One, the Only One, the Father of Beginnings, the Supreme Lord, the Singular God, except whom at the beginning none other existed. Egyptian priests had a particular obsession with the past and their vivid portrait of the great God in his first appearance. Those who look for an unseen creator in early Egyptian religion will be disappointed. He is a visible and concrete power, the Lord of Terror. The memory of this solitary light god and creator was old as the most ancient Egyptian ritual. His appearance and eventual departure shaped every aspect of the Egyptian world view. So, also in Mesopotamia, about which Stefan Landon raises the question of archaic monotheism. After prolonged study of Semitic and Sumerian sources, Stefan Landon concluded that veneration of spirits and demons had nothing to do with the origins of Mesopotamian religion. Rather, both in Sumerian and Semitic religions, monotheism preceded polytheism and belief in good and evil spirits. He further notes that on the pictographic tablets of the prehistoric period, the picture of a star repeatedly appears. The sign, he claims, is virtually the only religious symbol in the primitive period, and in the early Sumerian language, this star symbol is the itogram for writing God, High, Heaven, and Bright. It is also the ideogram of An, the oldest and loftiest of the Sumerian gods. Anu was the father of the gods and the central light at the universe summit, a god of terrifying splendor who governed heaven from his throne in the cosmic sea of Apsu. But the Sumero-Babylonian pantheon filled with competing figures of the primordial creator. Here, as in Egypt, the god of archaic monotheism is not a transcendent spirit or invisible power, but a central light. A Sumerian epic proclaims, Anu is the midst of heaven, gave him fearful splendor. According to the text, is like Anu and cast a shadow of glory over the land. Egyptian and Mesopotamian traditions of the solitary creator find many parallels in the later Hebrew, Greek, Persian, Hindu, and Chinese mysticism and philosophy. But it is the earliest imagery which illuminates the later and however unorthodox the idea may seem. The oldest records treat the great God's birth in the deep and his acts of creation as events experienced by the ancestors. Hearts were pervaded with fear. Hearts were pervaded with terror. 
when I was born in the abyss, proclaims the god in the pyramid text. The tradition has nothing to do with the origins of our planet or the universe, and the subject of the original creation legend is the formation of the greatest god's visible dwelling above. The legend records that when the creator rose from the cosmic sea, a great band of revolving islands congealed around the god as his home. The band appeared as well-defined, organized, and geometrically unified dwelling, a celestial abode fashioned by the Great Father. All space outside this enclosure belongs to unorganized chaos. The words which in the ancient language denotes this enclosure receives various translations as heaven, cosmos, world, land, earth, netherland. These are the terms which take on vastly different meanings in modern usage. In their original sense, the words signified one and the same thing, a band of light which appears to set apart the sacred ground of the great god from the rest of space. What is most compelling about the portrait of Aktam Ra is that numerous Egyptian divinities duplicate the image and the very traits of the great god are endlessly repeated in the figures of Osiris, Ptah, and Horus, of whom appears as the solitary god in the fiery sea, the god one who brought forth the company of gods as his own limbs, the god of the reverberating speech, the unmoving god producing the celestial revolutions, and the final source of water, and the impregnating seed of the cosmos. If we were to inquire of an Egyptian priest how he arrived at this notion of the supreme god, the priest would tell us that he did not arrive at the idea at all. The great god was a historical divinity who ruled heaven for a time, then departed amid great upheavals. The hymns and ritual texts simply record the incarnation of the god in the primordial era and recount the massive cataclysms which accompanied the collapse of that era as documented in the forms of petroglyphs all over the world. The dramatic events as witnessed all over the planet in prehistory would send civilization back to the primitive state for 6,000 years. That is, if you consider this event having taken place right around the time of the last ice age. And perhaps the Aurora was responsible for ending the Ice Age cycle, shifting Earth's settled pattern of behavior. Why does the Easter Island Rangu Rangu inscriptions show characteristics of the petroglyphs found all over the planet? Are the Nazca Lines a massive manifestation of the Aurora? Immortalized in the geoglyphs and the Nazca Spider is definitely showing a design of what the ancient earthlings were seeing. It seems they tried to make sense of what they were seeing in the sky by comparing the phenomena to shapes of animals that were of the earth. These shapes of characteristics are matching up with astounding accuracy all over the place. And it seems these civilizations who created them were stuck at these locations for sheltering as the immense discharge of plasmatic activity unfolded before their very eyes. Conservatively, between 15,000 to 11,000 years ago, the planet Earth experienced a series of climatic fluctuations. It is widely thought through study of the geological layer that extreme cold made it very harsh in some regions of our world that is habitable today with continental glaciers extending much further than they do today. But the climate started to warm and temperatures suddenly reverted back and this triggered a cold spell known as the Younger Dryads period. Based on Greenland ice core data, the Younger Dryads began and ended very abruptly, with the start dates to 10,900 BC and its ending, the final warming, beginning around 9,700 BC and may have occurred within an incredibly short period of time almost overnight, and this confounds researchers because it is unclear how our planet was habitable during the previous couple of million years, settled period. But we do know there were golden elements during this so-called ice age. The civilizations who flourished in the apparent ice even tell us as much. They don't tell us that it was frozen, they tell us it was golden, 
The Golden Age. The Hindus and the Egyptians tell us this was before the current wave of existence. That is before 5,000 years ago. And that puts it past the Younger Dryads. Also because of the Dark Age that followed the Younger Dryads before the re-emergence around 5,000 years ago. But how do we explain this pattern of abrupt climatic shifts? Perhaps a comet was responsible, as Robert Schock and many other leading researchers have pointed out. A comet hitting the land or a shallow ocean, or exploding above the land's surface, scattering dust and debris into the atmosphere could cause global cooling. But what about the warming events of 10,000 BC? In years past, Robert Schock had speculated that comets hitting deep oceans were responsible. A comet might break the thin oceanic crust, releasing heat from the hot magma beneath. This would trigger vaporized and displace water to rain down on Earth, releasing tsunamis that would wash across coastal areas, warming the Earth. But even with a comet or a series of comets bombarding the oceans, could the warm happen as quickly as the Greenland ice cores indicate? The mind-blowing similarities found in the petroglyph and pictographic records that relate to geoglyphs and even the undeciphered Rangu Rangu inscriptions of Easter Island may prove to be the biggest uplifting of answers ever formed in the minds of Earthlings separated by thousands of years from the minds of other Earthlings reaching across time and reality and delivering a message that could hold answers to our very existence on the planet we call home. But first, before the realization, let's do the homework. Let's sort the facts from the fiction and establish something missing from the existence of every Earthling alive today. The truth about our existence. We have to consider the concept of the fourth state of matter, plasma. Plasma consists of electrically charged particles and these phenomena are no strangers to stargazers anywhere and everywhere. With familiar plasma phenomena including lightning and the aurora borealis and australis as also the sprite phenomena. In the past, much more powerful plasma events sometimes took place due to solar outbursts and coronal mass ejections from the sun. But the sun has not always been alone in the sky display. If the petroglyph records matching up all over the world are to be believed, then solar emissions from other celestial objects are not a possibility, but a historical fact. Powerful plasma phenomena could cause strong electrical discharges to hit Earth from electrical plasmatic exchanges between planets in the solar system, burning and incinerating materials on our planet's surface as Dr. Anthony L. Peratt has asserted and established that petroglyphs found worldwide record an intense plasma event in prehistoric Earth. Anthony has determined that powerful plasma phenomena observed in the sky would take on characteristic shapes resembling humanoid figures, humans with bird heads, sets of rings or donut shapes, and snake shapes reflected in countless ancient petroglyphs and seemingly assimilating into the worship of gods, leading to the birth of religion in Egypt, Mesopotamia, and above all other influence, also on Easter Island, the most remote location on the planet. The Easter Island Rangu Rangu inscriptions remain a great deluder of observable hope. Recorded on antique wood tablets stands a great testament of the Aurora event. Characterized on these symbols are the same shapes as found on all other worldwide petroglyphs. The unmistakable similarities are a shocking tribute that is only being realized in the 21st century. Robert Schock has concluded, based on Anthony Peratt's groundbreaking observations, that the Easter Island Rangu Rangu tablets record a major plasma event in the sky of prehistoric Earth thousands and thousands of years ago. This was the event that brought a final close to the last ice age. Plasma hitting the surface of Earth could heat and fuse rock, incinerate flammable material, melt ice caps, vaporize shallow bodies of water creating an extended deluge of rain, and send the climate into a warming spell. The release of 
pressure that follows the melting of thousands of meter thick ice sheets can induce earthquakes and even cause hot rock under pressure to melt and erupt to the surface as volcanoes. The world was in chaos and this is the event recorded by petroglyphs and the Rangu Rangu text. How the Easter Island residents constructed the Great Moai is unclear. But the fact that Akivi Moai axis of the platform was oriented from north to south, getting the face of the Moai looks exactly at the point where the sun sets during the equinox of the Astral Spring, September 21st, and their backs face the sun of the dawn during the autumn equinox, March 21st. Among the oddities of Easter Island are the low-lying, solid, thick-walled stone buildings with narrow entrances that look like bunkers or fallout shelters, and the strange stone houses of Easter Island are similar to the structures formed by the walls and pillars of Gobekli Tepe. Could they, in both cases, have been protection from some type of phenomena emanating from the skies? Maybe this is the same for Durinkiyu. Maybe the ancients built bunkers to shelter from the plasma strikes. And what world did they leave behind, you have to wonder. According to standard chronologies, Easter Island was not inhabited until a mere millennium and a half ago. But do we really know when Easter Island was first colonized? And even if surviving Easter Island antiquities and structures are from a relatively late period, they may reflect much more earlier traditions and styles perhaps brought by settlers from elsewhere that date back to a time of intense plasmatic aurora discharging, and the Rangu Rangu tablets may carefully preserve ancient texts that were copied over and over, reflecting patterns in the prehistoric sky of our planet. The Easter Island Rangu Rangu script, it could be argued, records plasma events in the ancient sky. So too might certain carved motifs found at Gobekli Tepe. The connection between Birdman petroglyphs and plasma phenomena around the world. On Easter Island, we find Birdman petroglyphs, as well as bird men and bird symbols among the Rangu Rangu hieroglyphs, and even a great tradition of the Birdman remembrance and a Gobekli Tepe, a very similar bird form was carved into the pillars. Dr. Peratt records many plasma phenomena that can be interpreted as having the appearance of snakes and numerous snakes are found on the pillars of Gobekli Tepe, slithering vertically up and down the ends of some of the columns. Could these represent huge thunderbolts of plasma? Plasma hitting the surface of Earth could heat and fuse rock, incinerate flammable material, melt ice caps, vaporize shallow bodies of water, creating an extended deluge of rain and send the climate into a warming spell. The release of pressure that follows the melting of thousands of meter thick ice sheets can induce earthquakes and even cause hot rock under pressure to melt and erupt to the surface as volcanoes. The world was in chaos and this is the event recorded by petroglyphs, geoglyphs and the Rangu Rangu text. The plasma event eradicated advanced civilizations and high cultures of the time, fusing large swathes of built-up areas to vertified states and the radiation emanating from the plasma may have affected mental and physical abilities. This could be the basis for the nearly universal myth of a golden age, a time when beings on earth had mental abilities far surpassing those of later times. Plasma and electrical discharges hitting the surface of Earth may have been responsible for the vitrification of ancient stone structures seen in some parts of the world, such as various hill forts in Scotland. People cowered for their lives at the prospect of being turned to vitrified glass by supercell discharges radiating like intense thunderbolts onto our planet. The ancient civilization migrated away from an event they could not escape and as it intensified, they sought shelter in caves, under cliffs, in dwellings built of thick stone or carved into mountainsides. Perhaps Gobekli Tepe was intentionally buried in an attempt to protect it from an ongoing plasma events in an effort by the 
priest of old to send this information through the ages. Perhaps these places were meant to be recovered in the aftermath of an event that lasted longer than they had anticipated. So long, in fact, that they became forgotten about. The documentation of these events are the petroglyphs and other inscriptions now being recovered into a better understanding of the past. One that makes more sense today than the concept of time itself, only being in a primitive age and bewildering our state of being. Earth is located in the habitable zone of our solar system. Our sun is a yellow dwarf star and all the planets have seamlessly orbited the sun since we were captured into its orbit billions and billions of years ago. On a spiral arm of the Milky Way galaxy, it seems nothing has changed in our neighborhood in a very long time, or has it? For us to become conscious and then look out at the solar system from the Earth and begin to identify our location in the universe doesn't appear to be a coincidence. We are the remnants of stardust after all, just like every other object of matter in existence. And perhaps it is ingrained into our very being to recapture a godlike understanding of everything. Here on Earth in the past few hundred years, we have rediscovered the planets through telescope observation. But ancient Earth observers also knew about the planets of the solar system before the separation and further loss of understanding took hold. They tell us something different about our position in space. So different, in fact, to what we accept to be true that it is almost beyond comprehension. The petroglyphs, pictographs, geoglyphs, and the Rangu Rangu inscription document an intense aurora in the sky as visible from our planet. Incredible displays of plasma raining down onto the Earth that were documented in the form of petroglyphs cut into stone and the only thing that could survive what was going on, this eventually assimilated into religion and worship all over the world, but what caused such an event? What happened in the solar system in prehistory that would upset the planetary cycles so drastically? Ancient earthlings of prehistory eventually reformed civilization in the aftermath of this event, and when they did so, they began a worship of the gods in the sky, and these gods weren't physical beings. They were the planets. Ancient astronomer priest of Mesopotamia insist that the planets determine the fate of the world. In their prayers to the planets, they summon memories of a heaven-shattered catastrophe, a catastrophe that was still in the minds of earthlings at the time of Plato when he insist 2,300 years ago that the movement of the planets had once changed. The ancients were absolutely obsessed with the planetary gods who they perceived as giants in the sky, fighting with one another wielding weapons of thunder, fire, and plasma. Their wars not only disturbed the heavens, but threatened to destroy the earth. Ancient observers driven by fear all across the world from Mesopotamia to the Americas, honored the planets in an almighty obsessive global cultural response that assimilated from the memory of the events of prehistory. The evidence overwhelmingly points to a lost fact of history, seemingly so obvious having followed the research of Anthony Peratt and David Talbot that only a few thousand years ago, planets moved very close to the Earth, producing an intense electrical aurora event so intense that it destroyed the planet as we knew it in the epoch of the Golden Age. Ancient Earthlings observed these events from sheltered locations, documenting what they could, living how they could, in hope of change, they began to try to communicate through prayer, and we can now connect cultures at either ends of the planet as having spawned the same great myths, symbols, and ritual practices of antiquity. This was the effort to remember, to make sense of what is going on in a place that was out of reach. They had no control over the planets, and a costly misunderstanding of planetary history must now be corrected. Scientific researchers consider gravity to be the controlling force in the heavens. And from this assumption, we give credit to the doctrine of endless solar system stability and the belief that under the rule of gravity, the nine planets have moved on their present courses since the birth of the solar system.
Based on the evidence garnered from the petroglyph record and the recreation of these symbols in laboratory conditions, we contend that humans once saw planets suspended as huge spheres in the heavens. Immersed in the charged particles of a dense plasma, celestial bodies radiated electrically and the plasma discharge produced sky-wide formations emanating from the magnetic south and forming the squatter man in many different phases over millennia. In the imagination of the ancient myth makers, and in the words of Wallace Thornhill, the planets were alive, they were the gods, the ruling powers of the sky, awe-inspiring, often capricious, and at times wildly destructive. Cosmic lightning evolved violently from one discharge configuration to another, following patterns observed in high-energy plasma experiments and only recently revealed in the deep sea as well. Around the world, our ancestors remembered these discharge configurations in apocalyptic terms. They called them the thunderbolts of the gods. According to the Saturn myth authored by David Talbot, who asserts that Greek legends recall a remote and mysterious era of Kronos wielding a great stone sickle, the creator god of the harvest and member of the Titans whom ruled from the summit of Mount Olympus during the Golden Age before eventually being displaced by his own son against whom he warred violently. Kronos is preeminently the god king, his darker side concealed. The Greek poet Hesiod, first of the Western tradition writers in 710 BC says, First of all, the deathless gods who dwell on Olympus made a golden race of mortal men who lived in the time of Kronos when he was reigning in heaven. And they lived like gods without sorrow of heart, remote and free from toil and grief. Miserable age rested not on them. The fruitful earth unforced bare them fruit abundantly and without stint. They dwelt in ease and peace upon the lands with many good things, rich in flocks and loved by the blessed gods. The peaceful epoch of the golden age is clearly the age of Kronos. If we move over to the more ancient traditions in ancient Egypt, we can assert that among the Egyptians, the father of the golden age possessed many names but each tradition proclaimed the same original excellence of creation and throughout their history, the Egyptians believed in a time of perfection at the beginning of the world and in the earliest age. According to the Egyptian sources, the great God was the first king, a ruler whose life served as a model for all succeeding ages. With the god king Osiris, the Egyptians constantly associated a vanished golden age. As King Osiris, the beneficent being, taught his subjects to worship the gods, gave them the arts of civilization, and formulated the laws of justice. Founding sacred temples and cities and disseminating wisdom from one land to another, he became the benefactor of the whole world. But his eventual murder brought worldwide destruction and, among classical writers, the idea prevailed that Osiris lived on our earth as a man who was also a god. Egyptian sources too often portray him in human form, yet the early religious texts say again and again that Osiris was the supreme light of heaven, ruling from the cosmic center, and he was in fact the lord of the gods, god number one. His body formed the circle of the celestial residence of the gods and the secondary gods themselves constituted the limbs of Osiris and eventually the traditions of Osiris melt into those of Ra, the god one who came into being in primeval time according to ancient Egyptian text. Just as Osiris followers remembered his rule on earth, so did other Egyptians recall the terrestrial reign of the creator Ra in the lost echoes of history. To this age, the Egyptians continually looked back with regret and envy to declare the superiority of the one thing above all other things imaginable. It was enough to affirm its like had never been seen since the days of Ra. Ra, the father of gods, reigned over the terrestrial world, but wandered away when the heavens fell into disorder. Sir Ernest Wallace Budge writes that, All chronological tradition affirms that Ra had once ruled over Egypt, 
And it is a remarkable fact that every possessor of the throne of Egypt was proved by some means or another to have the blood of Ra flowing in his veins. However, the same belief can be applied to the god Horus, the god king, as well as Atom, Capria, Pitta, and Amon. And the fact which must be explained is that the memory of the creator king and his original age of abundance was far broader than any local tradition, to the point that the story was not limited to Egypt. Ancient tribes of Chaldea apparently owed their civilization to a powerful and benevolent figure named Oans, who ruled before a great flood swept the land away, according to Babylonian priest, who took note of their assimilation into Babylonian culture. Prior to the great figure, the tribes lived without order, like the beast. But the new god king who issued from the sea instructed mankind in writing and various arts, the formation of cities and the foundation of temples. And he also taught them the use of laws, of bonds and divisions, also the harvesting of grains and fruits. And in short, all that pertains to the mollifying of life he delivered to men. And since the time, nothing more has been invented by anybody. Sensationally, Oans is simply the Greek name for the Sumerian god Inki, worshipped in the city of Eridu at the mouth of the Euphrates. The tradition dates to the earliest stage of Sumerian history, a time when the myths say that Inki and his wife governed the lost paradise of Delmon, the pure place of man's genesis. Many ancient accounts attest that they alone reposed in Delmon, where Inki and his wife reposed. That place was pure. That place was clean. In Del Moon, the raven croaked not. The kite shrieked not kite-like. The lion mangled not. The wolf ravaged not the lambs. Ruling over this favored dominion, Inki introduced civilization to mankind, founded the first cities and temples, and set down the first laws. In the account of Barassus, the bringer of civilization appeared as a man emerging from the water. The earlier accounts call him the creator, and his home was the cosmic sea Apsu, the celestial waters of fire, rage, splendor, and terror. But Inki was only an aspect of the creator An, whose ideogram appears as the earliest Mesopotamian sign of divinity. In all the myths and temple hymns, the Sumerians distinguished the present age from that day, or the days of old, when the gods gave man abundance the day when vegetation flourished. The supreme figure reigning over this remote age was An, the central and highest light, whose foremost characteristics was Lugal, meaning king, and the ancient Sumerian claimed that the very institution of kingship descended from the heavens of An, and it was An who produced the golden age, when the destiny was fixed for everything that was engendered, when An engendered the year of abundance. How widespread was this memory of a golden age, founded and governed by the creator himself? In Mexico, legends recount the ancient ruler of Quetzalcoatl, who appeared from the sea to become the good and wise ruler of the golden age. The legend describes the god as a lawgiver, teacher of the arts, and founder of purified religion. He was the ancestral founding king, and all later Toltec kings considered themselves his direct descendants of Quetzalcoatl. All the arts of the Toltecs, their knowledge, everything, came from Quetzalcoatl, and the Toltecs were wealthy. Their foodstuffs, their sustenance cost nothing. They needed nothing and got everything they needed in a very happy time of prosperity, of fruitfulness on the earth. The story of Quetzalcoatl finds the same confusion of man and God as in the legends of Egypt and Mesopotamia. And early chroniclers wrote that although this Quetzalcoatl had been a man, they respected him as a god. Indeed, he was the creator, for he made the heavens, the sun, the earth. Not only was Quetzalcoatl the giver of life, the legend proclaims that the first divine generations emanated directly from him, and eventually the gods suffered a violent fate, bringing to an end this global tradition of a golden age, which is echoed all over the planetary culture of the earth from Denmark to China. 
The names are changed, but the overriding factors in each creation myth prevails to the same conclusions in Mexico, Egypt, and Mesopotamia. The Latin poet Ovid tells us that it was Saturn who ruled the Golden Age when he states that the first millennium was the Age of Gold. Then, living creatures trusted one another. People did well without the thought of ill. Nothing forbidden in the Book of Laws. No fears. No prohibitions read in bronze or in the sculpted face of judge and master. No brass-lipped trumpets called, nor clanging swords nor helmets marched the streets, country, and town. Had never heard of war and seasons traveled through the years of peace. The innocent earth learned neither spade nor plow. She gave her riches as fruit hangs from the tree. Grapes dropping from the vine, cherry, strawberry ripened in silver shadows of the mountain. And in the shades of Jove's miraculous tree, the falling acorn, spring tied the single season of the year. But then, old Saturn fell to death's dark country. There is not a race on Earth that forgot this cataclysmic event, the death of Saturn, the universal monarch, or the fall of Adam in the peoples the world over. For thousands of years awaited the full time of time's wheel when Saturn's kingdom would appear again to rescue the world from a decadent age of iron, which is widely thought to be the current age. The powerful memories of Saturn's age gave rise to a prophesied return, as announced in the famous lines of Virgil, where it is written that, Now is come the last age of the Cumene prophecy, the great cycles of periods born anew. Now returns the maid, returns the reign of Saturn. Now from high heavens descends a new generation. And O holy goddess of childbirth, Lucina, do thou be gracious at the boy's birth, in whom the iron race shall begin to seize, and the golden to rise all over the world again. Richard Kilbansky and his co-authors write in their study of Saturn and melancholy that Saturn possesses the double property of being the forefather of all other planetary gods and of having his seat in the highest heaven. On the oldest and highest of the Sumerian and Babylonian gods, whose primordial age was the year of abundance, which signified Saturn. And the same verdict is tacitly maintained by renowned researchers Alfred Jeremiah and Stephen Langdon, who identified the great god Ninurta as both the planet Saturn and form of Anu. And one can add the well-known fact that the Sumerian Inki, Babylonian E, the Oans, and Barassus came to be the translated word of Cronus, Saturn, by the Greeks. The accumulation of an event so dramatic in the Earth's atmosphere would see the birth of sky worship emerge from the cosmic cataclysm. Prehistoric people perceived what they saw as giant humanoid figures waging battle in the sky and, at the end of the cycle, as the apparent gods disassembled, an overall figure emerges. The Greeks and the Hindus tell us of the gods in the sky, seemingly visible for ages, and of course the Hindus show us different representations of the many gods visible over time as the great spectacle in the sky morphed throughout millennia. The Greeks tell us the different generations of the gods of the sky, Zeus, for example, being god of the sky, lightning and thunder, ruler of all the gods, as inherited from his father, Kronos, king of the gods and widely understood to be the planet Saturn, from which the great sky event of prehistory may have manifested to Earth observers and overwhelmingly influenced the very being of ancient earthlings. The iconography spread all over the planet of the sky god and emerged into art all over the Mediterranean region and ancient Near East. The ancient Greeks tell us the iconography comes from very ancient times, times referred to as archaic times even by the earliest Greek writers, and this does suggest a populous explosion in prehistoric times that relates to the sky spectacle directly. When the first of our kind re-emerged from the shelter of the caves and began to again claw back civilization from the brink, they re-emerged with a thinking of appeasing gods of the sky. Cultures emerged from this way of thinking and the squatter man of the petroglyph, the representation of the Z-Pinch Aurora, begins to be brought to life by ancient artists who remembered in the oral traditions. 
At first, there must be a visual remembrance, and this goes from petroglyph patterns to works of art in pottery, coins, and other materials capable of holding a striking resemblance of the prevailing figure witnessed all across the world. Known to the Greeks as the Potnia Theron, a humanoid figure, which is always being flanked by animals on either side, emerges into ancient cultures all across the earth. This widespread motif is recognized as a precursor of worship, the cosmic entity of the lost age of humanity from the time when our skies went electric, when planet Saturn went supernova. The figure of the Potney Theron is a representation of the manifested aurora and the animals flanking either side, sometimes snakes as seen in Greece and other regions, is actually immense plasmatic discharges radiating down on our planet. The ancient earthlings witnessed this. They believed this was a winged deity and they recorded this in petroglyphs. And later on, they would stylize their entire re-emergence of this event. And to the Greeks and the Hindus, they were gods and the so-called mythological episode in humanity's cavitous upbringing were literal events as perceived by prehistoric people. The emergence into art of the squatter man can be traced to the very earliest of times. For example, artifacts from the times of the ancient Scythians relate to an underground goddess who had presented herself to the people, daughter of a river god and seemingly dwelling above the mountains. In some accounts, she is half snake and, of course, the snake has been identified as being representative of the plasmatic thunderbolts of the gods. Ambiguous by their nature, these images are a category of representations that are frequently associated with rituals or transitions and limitation with the intermediate stages of creation, when the world is in neither its primal nor its finished state. At this transitional stage, when the country of Scythia already existed but was only in infancy, the sky goddess gave birth to the re-emergence of the Scythian people because this is what they saw. They believed this to be a great being. Similarly, in Greek belief, in the primordial world before people learned the laws of civilization, these great beings of the sky flourished in all their might and wonder, inspiring worship, implementing fear and faith. Confounding the earthlings who had lost prosperity and who had long sat in awe of the spectacle radiating above them, long they waited for a return to the time of old and they were comforted by this unimaginable widespread phenomena from which the mythological stories would emerge. It actually happened. Snakes, of course, are creatures of ambiguous character, gliding between the worlds above and below the earth, capable of bringing death and prosperousness, representing the electrical plasma discharging. Plants grow from the depths of the earth where the dead depart and they evoke fertility and renewal. Accordingly, both snakes and plants embody the idea of death and revival. The combination of human and vegetable or serpentine elements in a divine image implies a deity's power of life and death, relating to the aurora being both beautiful and dangerous to human beings, with the duality inherent in the combination of human and animal or vegetable elements being enhanced by the neutrality of feminine and masculinity in the snake. Thoughts awaken, curiosity stirs. Regardless of culture or origin, we use the great term Potnia Theron to identify this widespread phenomena. And we say it's a phenomena because this is exactly what had happened in prehistory for this wave of understanding to even begin to unfold. The Mycenaeans, heavily influenced by Minoan culture, presented the symbol in a Minoan manner and with her usual sacred symbols. However, by the late Mycenaean period, the old type of deity flanked by animals was forgotten, assimilating into cultural beliefs as the ages slipped by, as the memory of the event slipped into mythological status. The sky goddess is usually described as a human deity, but some authors associate her not only with wild animals, snakes, and birds, but further with a sacred tree and pillar with poppy and some lily. And eventually she looked like a mistress of trees and mountains. 
The Mycenaeans adopted the iconographical type of mistress of animals and applied it to the goddess of nature, who was represented with vegetation, mainly palms and papyrus flowers. The archaic Greeks, following the tradition used by the old iconographical scheme with their own aesthetic program, but over time the name of Potnian Theron and her attributes and functions were eventually assimilated into the Greek religion, the goddess of hunting, Artemis. The earliest representations of the sky goddess are thought to be in the various strange Venuses found throughout Europe, dating to the earliest of times with the seated woman found in Turkey in 1961, thought to date to 6,000 years before Christ, thought to be precursors of more advanced artistic renderings, assimilating into the master of animals which emerged in Mesopotamia in the fourth millennium before Christ, inspiring representations of human-animal hybrids in the ancient Near East and dynastic times of Egypt, where a representation from 3500 BC known as the Gibel el Ark knife shows a figure in a Mesopotamian dress who grapples with two lions. It has been connected to the famous Pasupati seal from the Indus Valley civilization, showing a figure seated in a yoga-like posture with a horn headdress and surrounded by animals. This in turn is related to the figure on the Gundestrip cauldron who sits with legs part crossed, has antlers, is surrounded by animals and grasps a snake in one hand and a torque in the other. And even in ancient Britain, we see the continued cultural explosion of the great representation of the immense Aurora event in prehistory in the form of the Sutton Hoo purse lid, which has two plaques with a man between two wolves. And the motif is common in Anglo-Saxon art and related early medieval styles where the animals generally remain aggressive. The understanding of the past is a minefield because we attempt to explain a happening in a comparison. By comparing what we see to what it looks like, and this is all related one way or another to the events recorded in the petroglyph record. The story of the events survived in the minds of the people for ages, and what they saw became godlike in nature to their thoughts. The evidence assembled over the past decades by David Talbot indicates that within human memory, extraordinary changes in the planetary system occurred. In the earliest age recalled by human beings, the planet Saturn was the most spectacular light in the heavens, and its impact on the ancient world was so overwhelming that it triggered a certain thought process all throughout the entire prehistoric world before the emergence of the first civilizations in Mesopotamia and the reoccupation by the dynasties of Egypt who then felt compelled to scroll hieroglyphs all over the place, describing the time of the gods in the sky. These were in fact representations of events that had passed through the thoughts of people in sheltered conditions for ages. A manifestation of thoughts from a visual scene that would eventually be lost to history. Generally accepted among Egyptologists and other researchers, is the belief that the Egyptian great god has his inspiration in the rising and setting sun. Atum, Ra, Osiris, Horus, and pretty much all the great gods of the dynastic Egyptians are explained as symbols of the solar orb being either the sun of day or the sun during its night journey. Of the Egyptian great father, there is no better representative than the one mighty Atom, whom Egyptologists usually regard as a sun god shining at night, and he is the acknowledged alter ego of the primal sun Ra, founder of the lost golden age. The coffin text says that the great god lives, fixed in the middle of the sky upon his support, and this refers to Atom whom the eminent Egyptologist Rundle Clark calls the arbiter of destiny perched on the top of the world pole. The Egyptian creation legend states that when Atum came forth alone in the beginning, he stood motionless in the cosmic sea. His description was the firm heart of the sky, 
To the Egyptians, Atom was the chief or center of the movement of the universe at the celestial pole, for the Egyptians knew the pole as the midst or heart of heaven, the single immovable point around which the movement of the stars occurred. Rundle Clark tells us that the celestial pole is that place or the great city. The various designations show how deeply it impressed the Egyptian imagination. For if God is the governor of the universe and it revolves around an axis, then God must preside over the axis. Clark writes that no other people was so deeply affected by the eternal circuit of the stars around a point in the northern sky. Here must be the node of the universe, the center of regulation. The Egyptian hieroglyph for Atom is a primitive sledge, signifying to move. To the god of the cosmic revolutions, the Book of the Dead proclaims, Hail to the Atom, Lord of Heaven, who giveth motion to all things. But while moving the heavens, Atom remained at rest or in one spot. Moreover, and contrary to nearly every universal opinion, the great god Ra has little in common with the solar orb. Unlike or every moving sun, Ra stands at the stationary midst or heart of heaven. He is the motionless sun who resteth on his high place. According to inscriptions, his home is the polar zenith. May your face be in the north of the sky. May Ra summon you from the zenith of the sky. My father ascends to the sky among the gods who are in the sky. He stands in the great polar region and learns the speech of the sun folk. Ra sets his hand on you at the zenith of the sky. The notion that Ra rises and sets in one spot is inseparable from the vision of Ra as the lord of Hetep, rest. In fact, the god does not literally rise or set at all. With the phases of day and night, his light comes forth and recedes. The god comes out and goes in. When we say today that the moon comes out at night, we do not mean it rises in the east. We mean simply that the moon grows bright. Precisely the same meaning attaches to the Egyptian words, which so often receive the translation for the word rise rather than a moving sun. Ra is the central pivot round which the lesser gods revolve. The god king Osiris, an obvious counterpart of the primeval sun Ra, is the god of firmness or stability. He is always a passive figure. And according to Wallace Budge, as a cosmic god, he appears as a motionless director or observer of the actions of his servants who fulfill his will. Osiris, the stationary heart of heaven, beautiful as the god of the motionless heart, proclaims the book of the dead. The hymns to Osiris as the lord of Hetep, rest or as the resting heart, one Egyptologist after another seeks to understand the imagery in terms of a night sun resting in an imagined underworld. However, numerous Egyptian sources show that the place of rest is the motionless center and summit. Osiris is exalted upon his resting place or in the heights. The hieroglyphs portray a column of steps leading to the polar zenith and it is here that the hymns locate Osiris. Hail O Osiris, thou hast received thy scepter and the place whereon thou art to rest and the steps are under thee. It is also futile to interpret Osiris' rest or motionless heart as mere symbols of death. The state of rest, one must remember, belongs to the living or resurrected Osiris. For the text applied to term Hetep rest to Osiris im Ankh as a living being. It should be clear to all who consider the language of the hymns that the unmoving heart means the unmoving God. For the heart is the God, as when the text describes the heart upon its seat. Osiris, the motionless heart, is the central stationary sun. O still heart, thou shinest for thyself, O still heart. The stationary sun, the sun at the polar zenith, also occurs under many other names in Egyptian religion, 
including, but not limited to, Horos, the firm and stable god who takes his place at the zenith of the sky. Therefore, in the hieroglyphs, all the Egyptian great gods appear as firmly seated figures. This immovable posture, which corresponds to divine imagery in many other lands, is no accident. The seated or resting god is the unmoved mover that the Egyptians conceived in the cosmic center as the source of celestial motion. It is clear from the terminology of the center, the heart of heaven is Ab, a word which has the concrete meaning of center or midst, but Ab also conveys the sense of lively motion. In the later usage, the determinative appears to depict a human figure turning around while standing on one foot in one place at rest. Denoted by the word Ab is the resting but ever turning heart of heaven. Similarly, while the term men means fixed or abiding, in reference to the god of the stable center and summit, men ninin means to go around. To the great god as the steadfast center or foundation stone of the cosmos, the Egyptians gave the name Ben Ben. But Ben alone is a verb of motion and particularly of going around. This dual, seemingly paradoxical relationship of motion and rest occurs throughout the Egyptian text and becomes intelligible only when one recognizes the central sun, the unmoved mover, as the source of the imagery. I am the air, the primary power of motion and of rest, reads the Book of the Dead. Though the words have a modern sound, they express the literal sense of the hieroglyphic text. It is in the root character of every polar god to move while at rest. Inseparable from the Egyptian motion of rest is the concept of silence. The motionless center of the heavens is the still place or region of silence. But those experts who connect the solar orb with the great God have nothing to say concerning such language. The God who stands at rest in the silent region is Ra, the sun god par excellence. Yet the entire concept contradicts the image of our wandering sun. What often prevents generalists from perceiving the stationary character of the primeval sun is the translator's unfortunate habit of substituting vague and intangible terms for literal meanings. Wallace Budge follows a common practice when he renders a hymn to Ra in these words, Homage to thee, O thou who art in peace. And from such terminology, one could hardly be expected to formulate a clear concept of the God. But the phrase in peace actually conceals a vital meaning, for the Egyptian original is M. Hetet. Literally, the hymn celebrates the God who shines at rest, or while standing in one place, shining over the golden epic before dramatic events would be perceived as cosmic entities battling in the sky eventually assimilating into stories, sparking worship and faith as prehistoric people try to make sense of something they try to document in the way of understanding that has been lost to history. But what do you guys think about this anyway? Comments below and as always, thank you for watching.